<laughs> so anyway, my first official question <laughs> is, you, can you describe then what's needed for transitioning an athlete from juvenile to elite senior level? Like your uh, experience. Yeah, and I mean, I think that is just such a big question because, um, you know, especially with girls, and you'll know this yourself, I've seen so many 14, 15, 16 year olds jumping 170, 175. And then, you know, they get to 18 and they're jumping like 160, 165 and they get to 20 and they've given up the sport. Now, some of that is just to do with lifestyle. Life moves on. Uh, some of it is to do with the challenges of adapting to being able to do all of these things with a woman's body as opposed to a, you know, a child or a preteen body. Um, and that's very challenging, particularly for, for women. Uh, so I think there's the, there's those issues. And um, when we look at all events, I think it is only a tiny percentage of really talented and successful juveniles who make it through to elite senior level. They may make it through to club senior level, even maybe some, you know, less prestigious internationals. But really to make it to elite senior, there's very, very few of either male or female who have, who have ever done that in Ireland in high jumping. Yeah. How, but then also, what would you think about coaching? Is there a lack of knowledge in coaching to to bring jumpers through as well? Okay, well, I just sort of sat down and I thought about what were some of the things that I felt were, were required. And um, I mean, the first thing, obviously, is a motivated and determined athlete. And um, they will probably have had to be determined to get through to even, you know, junior or under 23 level and be very tunnel visioned. And it can be challenging if that young juvenile has been very successful early on, and then suddenly there comes a, a phase in their development where they really have to work for success. Uh, so I think that's where I get the motivated, determined athlete, because it's not everybody who just has it within themselves to, to do that. Yeah, um, the second thing is a motivated and available coach um, in Ireland, as you know, 90 plus percent of coaches are people who do this voluntarily in their free time. Now, if we were talking about tennis or badminton or weightlifting or any of these other sports, you always pay your coach. But that is not the tradition in athletics. And, you know, I think there are arguments both for and against that. But um, you have to have an available coach. Now, I think I was able to do that journey with Deirdre because I had an extremely supportive husband who let me go and do all of this. Uh, and there were weeks that I spent more time with Deirdre Ryan than I did with my husband because both of us were working as well. Um, and I didn't have small children. So, you know, again, if you're a female coach and you have small children, um, it really does limit your availability to do early morning waits or, you know, late nights, something else or, you know, travel to competitions in Europe or do any of the other things because, you know, life gets in the way and it's not your paid job. Mm -hmm. um, the next thing an athlete needs to have is a body that can take the training. And again, I think all of us can think of motivated, determined athletes who really wanted to do the, the stuff, but whose body just didn't let them. And, you know, athletics is a really tough sport on the body. And uh, not everybody has a body that can stand up to the battering it gets <laughs> through uh, athletics training. Um, I think good lifestyle management is really important. Um and I'll say more about that later, but, you know, I mean, basic stuff like looking after your nutrition, and that can be a big issue for, particularly for female um, high jumpers where I suppose body size and body image can be a significant issue. And you know yourself, Olivia, from being a, a good level high jumper, I'm sure those were pressures that were around in your, your day and your squad as well. Um, adequate sleep, um, routine, I think having something to do outside of training is really important for the vast majority of people. This idea of being a full-time athlete absolutely does not suit a lot of people. 
and most people don't have the finances to do it anyway. I think you need some interest and some life outside of athletics. So I think that whole area of uh, lifestyle management and having a, you know, a work life balance or in this case, sort of a sport life balance is, is really, really important. Um, a supportive but not over pushy family. Uh, you know, people who cook your meals, drive you to where you need to be, support you, but without pushing you or being too involved or interfering, you know, with the coaching or, you know, any of those sort of things. And a lot of the people that you'll see who have succeeded, not all, of course, but a lot will have had that sort of family structure. Maybe their parents were involved in some coaching, maybe they were involved in administrative stuff uh, in, in athletics clubs, and maybe they were officials, that kind of thing. Now, adequate finances, I'm sorry, but this is a really important factor. And there used to be, I don't really, I'm a little bit out of touch with it today, but there used to be huge struggles to try and get on the funding pathways and uh, to get sponsorship and to do stuff. And, you know, it can be really, really difficult. And just having a good team around you um, I think nutrition is really important. I think the whole mental side of the game is is really important, but I would think that, wouldn't I? Um, S&C advice, the support of uh, Athletics Ireland, and I think particularly a good club group to do at least some of your training with, because the general training, a lot of that can be done within the group. And folks will keep going to training, you know, when there's uh, their pals are there. And, you know, I mean, OK, you have to be able to move above that when you're in, in the elite area. But just having some sort of a training group or a training partner or somebody that you do some of your S&C with, and, you, you know, things like that, I think, can also be really helpful. So uh, for me, those were some of the things that really jumped to mind when I was looking at the the transition from elite uh, from you know good junior good juvenile if you like to an elite senior and there's very few high jumpers that have made it to elite senior in Ireland. And was Deirdre the first jumper that you brought to elite level? Yes. Or, yeah. So then with your knowledge did you have much knowledge gaps or how was that path like for a lot of coaches you know you can get into the run of juvenile after junior maybe ju up to junior but then the elite path is very different you know were you fearful of it or how did you attack it as a coach? Well I can remember um, the first year that Deirdre jumped I think it was 1991 indoors in, in, in Glasgow and um, Alison Kerbishley, who was working for the BBC, coming up to me and saying, oh, this is an amazing breakthrough, which it you know, was at the time. And, you know, you're going to have to get, a, you know, a manager and sponsorship. And I'm like, oh, my God, I do not know anything about this, you know. Yeah. And um, at the time, um, your mentor and mine would have been the same. Uh, no relation to you, but Oliver Scully. Um oh, yeah, so the, I suppose the the 70s, the 80s and the early 90s until his sad and untimely death, he would have been my main um, mentor. We used to meet every week for lunch and I would go over training programs with him and I would talk about stuff. And he would, in those days, of course, there was no internet or anything like that. And he would bring me in uh, copies of relevant articles from the Australian uh, sports literature and he would bring me in stuff from Italy on plyometrics and you know he was so far ahead of the the curve uh, and I remember him back there asking for a force platform and you know BLE just sort of looking at him like he had two heads um, you know so I think he was um, he would have been my first sort of person that I met regularly and, you know, was my my mentor. And unfortunately, he died pretty much around that time. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to do this without Oliver? Uh, that was one of my, you know, things. Yeah. But like you just you go to conferences, you go to meetings, you meet other coaches, you um, try and pull whatever resources there are around. You ask questions, you read and. Um, you know, you you had to go outside of Ireland a lot, though, I'd say, for, yes, for that. Yes, I did. Because the information didn't exist. No, not really. Yeah. Um, well, other than with Oliver. And yeah. um, I was sort of thinking about, you know, who did, how did I sort of educate myself? And 
the very first person was Ron Murray, who was a, actually a professional high jump coach in the UK. Yeah. And um, Father Liam Kelleher got him over to Middleton. Now, I yeah. would have been about 16 at the time. And he did a course on a grass pitch in Middleton. And uh, myself and my friend Sheila Flatman went down and I think he took pity on us and asked us back to Crystal Palace. And he said, look, you have to pay for your own flights and accommodation, but I'll, I'll coach you for free. And he did. And we stayed like a week or two. And uh, it was like a real eye opener because he was coaching people who were going to the European juniors. And he coached uh, Barbara Ink Penn Lawton at the time. And she was an Olympic athlete. And, you know, so we just sponged up everything. And when we went back, we kept in touch with Ron and he sent us S&C Pro. I mean, this is the, yeah, there would be 1973, four, five, that, that sort of time, you know, right back in the day. Yeah. And, okay. um, he, he helped us and Sheila and I kind of coached each other because really nobody was coaching flop, Fosby flop at the time. They were coaching straddle uh, and scissors. And then um, Marjorie Adams, um, she was a PE student at the time and newly qualified. And she helped me a bit, too. So those would have been my sort of initial learning would have been through through Ron Murray and then obviously Oliver Scully. And after Oliver died, um, I would have linked with Dr. Liam Hickey, who mm -hmm. was a former um, pole vault record holder. And he was a PhD researcher in, in S&C. And he was the, the, a leader at that stage in the IRFU and the newly professional IRFU. They, all the coaches were um, from an athletics background. You have people like Dave's. Uh, Dave Fagan, um, there was uh, Sean Whitney, I think, was involved, um, and yeah. obviously Liam. Yeah. Sorry, Liam Hennessy, not Liam Hickey, Liam Hennessy. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I used to meet Liam. I would do out S&C programmes for um, Deirdre, and I would meet Liam, and sometimes uh, Jim Kilty as well, and we would talk about things. And, you know, you just have to be kind of open and try yeah. and learn. So and then, you, go on, yeah. yeah. I was going to say there because you you know you you have a lot of knowledge and experience in weightlifting. Mm -hmm. So I do, going yeah. back to what you learned in there in the beginning in S and C, is there anything you would have done differently from all the knowledge you've gained over the years, or is it a case of sticking to the basics, doing the basics right? Well, I think there's a bit of both. I mean, all of us can look back, I think, at yeah. our own careers and at our own coaching, and you do the very best you know how at particular times in 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 your in your career and um you know you just do the best you can you get as much knowledge and you try and um i suppose the other thing that's really important is that athletes are individuals mm -hmm. and uh you know what's really important for one athlete may be less important for another so you know if we're going on to the sort of the importance of s and c um I think that, you know, injury prevention is one really key factor. And the second is obviously optimizing performance. I mean, that's why you're doing it. You want someone to have a strong enough body that they can manage the training, but you also want to optimize performance. So those are kind of two different bits of the, the, the menu, if you like. And then the third thing is, you know, really adding variety and interest to training. I mean, you can't just high jump all the time. No. Um, and, you know, as you say, you don't even have a high jump down in, 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 in Limerick. So there's all of that just adding interest. I think it's great to work with a physio who's a sports physio and has good knowledge and um, to really talk with other coaches. And, uh, you know, now that we're able to, uh, you know, maybe start going back to some face to face conferences. That's where I've often picked up some real gems of things, though the online um, coach education over the last couple of years has been fantastic. I haven't done as much coach education in years as I have yeah. done, you know, That's online. Great. So I think some sort of combination of the, the two is is uh, really, really important. Um, but I think this idea that, you know, athletes are individuals and whereas, you know, the principles will be the same for everyone, the particular emphasis for, for different athletes will be will be different. And what do you think then, Lucy, of um, coaches who are transitioning with an athlete? Like you obviously went off and learned the SNC yourself. Mm -hmm. Some coaches might look to outsource this sort of source SNC, but high jump SNC is very different to other types of SNC. So what would you say to coaches who don't have the knowledge yet? 
do they trust the outsourcing you know not necessarily mm. because i mean i think there's a lot of people out there who like do snc but you know it might be more geared towards rugby players or gaa or you know other sports um and i think there's definitely a role for basic stuff um definitely but there is a role for, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, once you've done some of the general work, how do you then make it more specific to to high jumping mm -hmm. um, as compared to even long jumping or triple jumping, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think there's like a little bit of both, but it depends where you are in the country, um, you know, how much time you have to give um, what your interest level is. Yeah. So I think it's going to be different for different coaches. And, you know, just about all of us are volunteers mm -hmm. and, you know, we have families, we have jobs, uh, we have other athletes to coach. You know, it can't be just all about, in many cases, it can't just be all about like one athlete. Yeah, exactly. And another question I was going to ask you there is, um, would you have uh, most, I, I know you're saying it's it's individual to the athlete, but in terms of SNC rough guidelines, when would you start an athlete? Well, I know you can do plyometrics and there's you don't it, it's not all about the weights. But when if you were to give a rough guideline in your experience with the athletes you've coached over the years? Well, I suppose, you know, if we look at SNC, there is uh, plyometrics, which um, can be started. You know, I mean, children skipping and doing hopscotch. Uh, you know, the children don't do a lot of that anymore. But when they did do more outside, there's lots of things. I can remember as a child doing a thing called German jumps, which was a whole load of elastic bands joined together. And you started off at ankle height. So you'd put them around the base of two chairs and you jumped over the first bit. Then you jumped over the second bit. You turned around and you jumped back and it then you put it up to calves and then you put up to knees and then you, you know, and it went yeah. higher. I mean, all of that was plyometrics. We yeah. played horse jumping in the back garden with canes and clothes pegs and we'd walk. Skipping on the street, we used to play. Yeah. <laughs> and jumping backwards over the rope and all sorts of. Yeah, all of that kind of, I mean, yeah. that is all plyometrics. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody needs core stability work. Mm. And um, I remember talking to one of the coaches in the club sort of about 10 years ago, who was more a distance coach and him saying, yeah, Lucy, I keep forgetting the kids today don't do the stuff we did. I'd be cycling to school and back. I'd then maybe play a GAA match. I'd help on the farm. I'd be throwing bales of hay around. I'd be doing stuff. These kids get driven to school and they sit behind um, screens for, for the rest of the day or, you know, at desks and screens. So they don't have the sort of level of general fitness or coordination. And um, if they haven't done sports at an early age or they haven't done gymnastics or they haven't done, you know, some of the things where you have to be more coordinated, they can come to you at 12 or 13, you know, with no mobility, uh, very little coordination and um, you have to do the basics that you wouldn't have had to do some years ago. So I think core, core, some sort of core work, I mean, it can be boring, but you can make it a bit fun and you can introduce it as part of a warm up, part of a cool down. And um, plyometrics, again, can be part of warm up games. You can be jumping, you know, from side to side over lines. You can be hopping on one leg. You can be doing, you know, the younger kids can do lots of that. Um, Certainly in the Olympic weightlifting world, there are there has been a lot of more modern research, which very much is supportive of introducing the key movements in um, that would be the Olympic lifts, which aren't the most event specific for high jump, but they're a really good place to start with some general um, how to manage a bar and how to to do some of the the, the things. I, I wouldn't get too tied up with the Olympic lifts, but they are useful if you have it. It's a useful, I think, mm -hmm. thing to have in your your mix. Um, but that can be done from a, a young age with you know light bars with bamboos. You're teaching the movements, and then when they go on to be able to to use um, a slightly heavier bar, you just gauge that per per individual as well. And, you know, I mean, in the Olympic weightlifting world, we have 10 year olds compete, 10 year old girls competing and, you know, they, they won't be lifting huge weights and they'll be more on their technique rather than on the, the weight they lift. But um, that used to be thought to be bad for their joints and their development. But that's been rubbished uh, in a lot of more recent research. 
um, it's it's actually good for kids to be strong and yeah. to be able to control their 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 movements um, from an early age, and they're not doing a lot of these things that you and I've just been talking about. So mm -hmm. sometimes you have to introduce these things. So I would say this. Plyo's core, general strength and specific strength. And I think if you start with the sort of idea of working uh, with a physio and identifying people's, you know, strength and weaknesses, their, their prehab and uh, rehab needs at the beginning, get a good sports physio evaluation. I think that's a good idea. They'll tell you where the, you know, the the the, the different difficulties and challenge are for those particular individuals and then you have some time in your training where each person maybe works on their their own particular prehab needs that maybe as part of the warm-up um i would try and teach the basics of good technique and i've just started that with a new bunch of um people this year just done two or three sessions you know how to pick up a bar uh, you know how to what are the correct positions you know how to to do just some of those very basics which are going to stand to them one way or another um I would also really recommend things like yoga, uh, which has, a, yeah. depending on what type you do, can have a really significant isometric strength component in it and also really helps athletes with their awareness of positioning, uh, body positions, coordination, balance. And, you know, all of these things are really, really important. Um, Pilates, if people have some extra time, great for core and for prehab. Um, where possible, I start with sort of body weight circuits, just getting people to do body weight circuits and um, medicine ball work. They love that. And mm -hmm. um, if you have a sturdy wall in a gym, as we had in volunteer community school, we could throw medicine balls against that, could do pairs, exercises. Do you know what you can put in like a 10 minutes at the beginning and end? Um, the Olympic lifts, but you want to have someone who can knows what they're doing in, in that area. You know, they're not super specific, but they're, you know, a lot of them is a, is a lot of good movements there. They're explosive, dynamic, um, multi-joint. Um, they help people to just get generally sort of coordinated. Then I suppose when I think of plyometrics, I think of box jumps, mm -hmm. which are, um, you know, more in the, the vertical field. And then obviously your more traditional horizontal plyos, um, you know, your hops, your steps, um, all of those kind of things that you can do and all the combinations that you can think of and medicine ball, which work on both of those pathways, depending on what exercise you do. And um, the, they also give you great variety in training and uh, you can bring in an element of testing. And, you know, I have sort mm -hmm. of testing records of a number of athletes um, over, over the years and, you know, just because you're brilliant at a standing long jump doesn't mean you're going to be an amazing long jumper or high jumper. But, um, you know, all of those movements are are helpful. And, uh, you know, using a jump staccato, now I, I intend to do a jump staccato once we move up to St. Thomas's and we have our own space and we have a little bit more time. I'll do a jump staccato. I'm teaching some of the elements of it at the moment and we'll see where they are in sort of October and then we'll see where they are, say, just coming up to Christmas. Mm -hmm. Things have improved. Um, young athletes like to do that and older ones and again medicine balls throws for distance and um, that that kind of stuff you know it's all power and mm -hmm. um, now you can also obviously nowadays if you're lucky enough to have access to it you can do more technical testing and Oliver Scully's 1980s request for a force platform there are force platforms in several um, locations including your own down in Limerick yeah. but um, getting access to them is very difficult um, in my experience, I mean, unless you're a carded athlete and, you, you you know, you can get stuff and, you know, there's going to be very few carded athletes in high jump. Um, so you can look at all of those. With regard to sort of specific exercises, I remember at one of the European coaching conferences, like really pushing one of the German coaches. I'm like, well, what would you include anyway? You know, and eventually he said, well, I probably have some form of step ups. Um, he said, I would definitely have for high jumpers include some form of calf raises, uh, which was great because we were already doing those. Um, he said some form of, of squatting, you know, not necessarily full squats yeah. um, and perhaps um, power cleans or split snatches, that kind of thing. Yeah. 
So the, the, that was that particular person's response. Um, but, you know, there's lots of lots and lots of things you can do and they don't necessarily have to require weights. And um, when uh, Fuzz, um, Fuzz Khan was over the, was it last year or the year before? When was Fuzz over? 2019, was it? Was it Before, that long ago? Yeah, I think okay. so, because then we had, we got locked down in 2020. Yeah. I think it was November 2019. Well, I mean, he was... Something my eye here, sorry. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> he was talking about, it, you know, again, illustrating a lot of sort of exercises that you could do. And, you know, they didn't have anything to do with sort of weight training, but it's about using your body in event-specific yeah. ways. And, you know, some athletes will have preferences. Some coaches will have preferences. And, you know... At elite level, there's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences too, because, you know, athletes will have their own patterns of, of, of strengths and weaknesses and their own needs. Yeah. And what do you think then of the max strength lifts, you know? The one, okay. Yeah. Max strength. Okay. So I would say that, you know, obviously you go from general to general training to with a senior athlete who's well established I would do some work on improving their max strength yes but you don't want to bulk them up mm -hmm. now that's not really a huge issue for women and um, women high jumpers um often they're, they're not going to bulk up no matter what you did with them and um, because that's just their biology but uh, certainly with some male jumpers you don't want to bulk them up so you might you, there's particular sort of patterns of um sets that you would use that would be less likely to bulk people up mm -hmm. um and you know, there's no need to go into that in a conversation like this. No, but, no. But, um, but just to, so people can be aware that, aware. that, yeah. that there's another level again. Exactly. That's... I think that's what I'd be saying, that there is yeah. another level. Um, so, yes, of course, you want to improve people's strength. But with the younger ones and, you know, the vast majority of the 60 people that you're going to get uh, coming to the, the seminar on yeah. Saturday, they're going to be coaching juveniles. Um, and they're not going to be coaching seniors, even no, let alone no. elite seniors. Yeah. So for them, I would be saying you teach the movements. Yeah. You know, bar only. Uh, you start with a stick um, or a piece of waven pipe and you teach the movements. So it's all about technique, technique, technique and teaching the movements correctly so they become automatic. And then when you're in the lucky position of being able to put a little bit of weight on the bar, they're able to do that. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely would not get stuck into max strength. And with the guys that I'm just starting off on the road again, as beginner level on this end, uh, we're, we're doing technique, 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 um, you know, and I, I'm not max strength. You know, max strength is not going to be an issue. No. And but then say when you were coaching Deirdre, when when did you get uh, when did you transition to max strength with Deirdre? Was it at the 191 or after that or? No, it was a bit earlier than that. We really yeah. started doing stuff more first year university, but yeah. that was also in parallel with what I knew at the time. Yeah, um, I wouldn't have been hugely experienced in in the weightlifting area at that stage at all. Yeah. Um. So, like, we just did the best we could. The other thing, um, with lifts is this idea of speed transfer. Um. So you know there will come a stage in the periodization of your your snc program where you will be doing maybe some small amount of slightly heavier um movements and you follow them with speed transfer so for example if you were doing a set of squats you might then follow it with a set of uh, tuck jumps or mm -hmm. something like that you know um if you were doing step ups you might follow it with jump step ups with no weight mm -hmm. you know and the tuck mm -hmm. jumps would have no weights yeah. so and then as you get closer to competition, obviously your balance between the the, the, the max and the speed transfer and, you know, the, the rate that you're doing them, all of that kind of changes as, as, as well. So there's um, there's a number of ways of you don't just go and lift, you know, you yeah, have skin in the cash. It has, yeah. has to be structured. Yeah. And yeah, that would be another another thing. Yeah, I actually have a good book here. Um periodization of strength training here I lift it up here Matt Horstall recommended it okay so yeah um you you've probably covered a lot of that yourself in your own 
quote over your own quote yeah. here's the importance of getting the periodization right when it comes yes. to strength training um but right. for most of the people who are coming on saturday it'll be it, body weight circuits yeah. it will be technique with a stick uh, or you know a very light bar and um, it will be learning how to learning to train learning mm -hmm. to strength train it'll be medicine ball it'll be plyos it'll be core stability that kind of thing and so then lucy say for that for that um teenage group which will probably be a lot like 15 16 mm -hmm. 17 years of age well, i know and it's you can't give um general statements because it really does depend on the individual athlete but would you be looking at three days a week four days a week of strength training. yeah or, no of training of their general it's a it's a question most coaches ask when you know for yeah. for that age group what what should they be doing you know you see there's so many factors involved there and you know one of the, go back to one of the key factors which is the availability of uh, facilities and the availability of time for both the athlete and the coach Mm -hmm. And I think this is a really good time of the year to sit down with uh, an athlete and their parents. And, um, you know, if there's another coach, for example, we have a sprints group for some of our younger athletes There's a sprints group where um, the jumpers will do a lot of their running training. And there's me. I'll do come in and do the jumps and I'll do the bit of the S&C. Uh, and we all have sat down you know at the beginnings and we've said look what is um you know so and so's availability what other sports are they doing what are they doing in school how active are they how and i would be saying the importance of rest and recovery really uh is is the key thing and start with don't be tunnel vision that athletics is the only sport they're doing it probably isn't no, you know they're playing it. hockey they're um playing gaelic they're doing hurling, they're they're doing rugby. They're, well, if they're doing rugby, they're probably not doing athletics, to be honest, yeah. unfortunately, anymore. Um, yeah. So, you know, you need to know what your athlete is doing on the other days, that they're not playing a game match and then coming into training and you're expecting them to be fresh or they're not training with you and then they're going to get in trouble with their team sports coach mm -hmm. because, you know, and at a certain level, they're going to have to make a decision you know, am I going to go with athletics or am I going to go with Gaelic or soccer or hockey or, or whatever? And that's, you know, that's great. Whatever sport they go with, that's great. It, it's it's something we try to do here where I live. We're calling it LTAD, long-term athlete development, but let the athlete decide. Yeah. The GAA, soccer, rugby and ourselves, we all came together because we were noticing that the kids that um, were getting were getting overtrained. They were burnt out. And it was to like let athletics be the physical conditioning for the for the athlete, the, the player, and then let them learn the techniques of soccer, the techniques of GAA when they went and played it. Yeah. It hasn't really taken off. It took off for a little bit and then yeah, <laughs> there's always politics. There is, and everyone gets very yeah. possessed. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, with the team sports, the trump card would be, well, you can't play if you don't come to training. Yeah. And then they sit on the sideline and they play for 10 minutes, you know, yeah. and do you know, it's it's very difficult. Yeah. Um. And if you're a performance athletics club, you do expect them to compete as well. Yeah. Um. If you're not a performance group, well, that's fine. You know, they can just keep fit. But you know, I say I am not a keep fit class for Gaelic football or rugby. Yeah. This you, is an athletic club. You you touched on something else that's really important. I stress it a lot myself. The rest and recovery part. Yeah. It's so important to be fully recovered before you start your next training session. And it's the sign of fitness then how quickly you can recover. But yeah. it, but but there now with your because stress is a big part as well in recovery. Yeah. So but that just bring you can lead in now to your the mental coaching for athletes and your 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 wealth of knowledge is it nearly 40 years of as yeah. a clinical psychology psychologist. Talk away, Lucy. So I think you know. If I'm looking at a, a young athlete, my thing would be the absolute minimum should be one day of complete recovery, no sport, and another day of active recovery. Now, that could be your yoga class. It could be going for a walk. It could be, you know, cycling with your mates. It could be, you know, something that's not too exhausted, you know, that's just something a little bit different. 
And, you know, that's where maybe you get your yoga or your Pilates class in, that kind of thing, that it's act, what I call active recovery. And then another day when they just rest, because teenagers need to rest. Um, all of us, uh, and I'm very aware of this with Masters athletes as well, at the other end of the spectrum, which is the biggest growing area of our sport, I have to say. And uh, we've a lovely group in, in DSD of um, Masters sprinters and jumpers and throwers. Uh, but, you know, again, you can't train like a senior. So with juveniles, you can't train them on watered down senior programs and masters. You really can't train them on watered down seniors programs either, uh, because there's a lot of other X factors there. But recovery is huge. And if we don't recover uh, and allow our bodies to recover and regenerate, um, we don't improve our strength. We don't improve our speed. We don't improve most things. And I agree with you that there are many people going around who are overtrained because they're just simply trying to do too much. So I think that's the first thing I would say is about recovery. Now, that includes sleep. Now, I do a lot of work on sleep in my professional life. I run groups for people who have insomnia and mental health issues. Um, I've done a lot of training in, in that area. But sleep is hugely important and adolescents need a huge amount of sleep because of the developmental stage they're in. So, you know, we try and force teenagers to get up and be in school for, you know, half past eight or a quarter to nine. That doesn't actually fit with the way their brains are functioning at that stage. Um, we'd be much better off having them start at 10 o'clock, which wouldn't suit their parents who are trying to get to work, but it would suit the adolescents brain development, concentration and capacity to, to learn. But that's another story. So sleep is really important and adequate nutrition is really important, both pre and post training and then just the food that they eat. And I think it is a great idea to get a nutritionist, sports nutritionist in, sports dietitian in to talk to your local club and um, to look at some of the specific needs of the speed and strength athletes as compared to the, the middle and long distance athletes, because it is a little bit different and the needs for masters athletes are, are different again. So I think sleep and nutrition. And um, I'm afraid for many female high young and not so young female high jumpers over the years, I have seen a lot of difficulties, a lot of issues around eating and uh, body weight and size um, and just an overemphasis on, on that and the athletes getting very sucked into very poor nutritional habits. Mm. So I'm putting that out. You're not going anywhere if you're not doing the basic lifestyle management stuff. If you're not eating properly, if you're not sleeping properly, you're not looking after your health and stress levels. You don't have a good routine and you know you don't have something to do outside of athletics. Um, I think that is not exactly a, a road in the right direction. So I'm going to say that lifestyle bit first, which is the boring bit that pe people don't want to hear. With regards to mental skills, I think that they are really important for all athletes and coaches and ideally should be part of good coaching. It's not like that, well, there will be some place for doing it separate to, to coaching, but, um, you know, it's not like, oh, I have to make, you know, this is my mental skills session. You know, your mental skills should be part of everything that you're doing. Um, and um, coaches should have at least some coach education. And I'm not sure what the current content of the AAI coaching courses are. I know that I used to um, present on the sort of the level three um, on, on these sort of areas, but I, I, I don't know what's happening there, there now. Um, I think that... There's a number of areas that are, are really important. One is um, anxiety management. Now, anxiety is your friend. Probably if you don't get a bit anxious and head up before a competition, you are probably not going to perform at your best. But everybody is different. And some top athletes will tell you they never experience their nerves. Um, but most people do or most people have reach a window where suddenly they do. They may have managed fine up until a particular level. And then for the younger ones, maybe they get to their first All-Ireland and they fall apart. 
or they get to their first big international and they fall apart. And that can be devastating because they've never learned how to manage that. So I think there's a, a lot of work that you can do around getting the most out of yourself performance wise and understanding and working with your anxiety. Then there's the whole area of mindfulness and capacity to focus and being able to move from an external focus where you're very aware of all the things that are going on around you to a much more selfish internal focus where you're focusing on yourself, what you need to do, what needs to happen next. And you're really ignoring the guys in the, you know, the field beside you or, you know, that's there's nothing you can do about them. All you can control. The factors you can control are your own performance and what you do. You can't do a thing about whether somebody comes out and jumps, you know, 10 centimetres higher than they've ever done before or, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think that capacity to learn some mindfulness skills and capacity to focus for short periods of time and to be able to go in and out of that focus, that can be taught. And I think that's a really useful thing to be able to do. Um, good goal setting is really important. I see an awful lot of bad goal setting, um, but I think that goal setting used properly, uh, where you have both outcome goals and uh, process of goals, um, can be a really helpful way to um, support an athlete and coach evaluating a competition, and particularly a competition where they didn't win. Maybe we're never going to win. But if their only goal was to win, well, then, you know, the whole thing is a failure. So good goal setting, both around a competition, around a training session, being very clear what you're trying to achieve and whether you do achieve it, getting feedback from the athlete. I tend to ask athletes in my squad at the end of session, I say, OK, what's your takeout point from today's session? You know, what are you going to be taking with you from this session? And I'll get all sorts of responses, some that surprise me, some that interest me. Um, and the, but they're always it's always a useful question to ask. Um, I think a competition review for the older athletes, having a sort of structured competition review form that maybe you use um, can be really helpful. Um, I'm doing some work on that in the, with the weightlifting guys at the moment and um, I do a bit of work in athletics on it as well and doing a season review and really looking at what you achieved and then what helped you achieve that because that's a really important question and then what were your disappointments and um, what have you learned from that and it's a bit like this you know I either win or I learn and if something didn't go right, you know, what have you learned from that? And how are you going to incorporate that into next year's training program um, next week's training session, uh, you know, depending on where we are in, in the year? And then again, back again on this lifestyle management bit, you know, you really need to work on your sleep uh, you really need to work on your nutrition. You need to have routine and to know where you are and where you're going and to try and manage your stress levels better. And recovery is key. And that is both physical and mental. So the physical recovery we, we've talked about, but the mental recovery is really introducing variety mm -hmm. uh, giving space for people to have different um, experiences. And that might be taking a training squad off somewhere else. You know, we're going to train in the sand dunes today or, you know, we're going to go and train in the NIA today. Uh, we're going to go and we're going to go and join Olivia's group and, you know, have a session down in Limerick or we're going to invite Olivia's group up to St. Thomas's and, you know, we're going to do a session up there. You know, spice it up, make, make it, it different, fun. Make it, yeah, fun. make it fun. Uh, and that is partly the coach's responsibility, yeah. and partly the, the athlete, because there are a number of boring basics you, you just have to do, mm -hmm. but you can dress them up differently. You can locate them differently and they can be done in different ways. Mm -hmm. I have another question about the mental coaching side. It happens a lot in high jump, male and female, teenagers, whatever age. When the bar goes up, they might have cleared the bar by that much and then the bar goes up by this much mm -hmm. and they're gone. Have you got tips? 
Well, I think that, you know, it's the same. Um, you're looking for consistency mm -hmm. and it's the same in weightlifting. You know, you will get somebody who is doing, um, you know, a clean and jerk beautifully up to, you know, let's say some of the, the top junior girls, you know, they're up to like eight, 86K or they're, they're 88K. And then the minute it hits 90K, they're gone. But they're gone because they're not following the process. Uh, they do something different. They do a little pre-pull. They do something different. And with the high jump, it's very often because they try too hard. So different athletes respond to different approaches here. Um, I would say in general, you've got to have opportunities to try the higher heights. And for many people, those opportunities are competitions and it might be a smaller competition. Um, other people will be able to clear those heights in training, but not clear them in competition. Mm. And that's where maybe your, your anxiety management stuff and your, your you know, comes in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's, there's no one answer, but I would try and work on the correct technical model, but to try and keep upping the, the bar gradually, you know, when you do it, because if you're jumping 170 and, you know, you need to jump 176 or 178, um, there's no point sticking it up to 178 all the time and just doing it wrong. Um, but at the same time, what is needed at 170 and the timing of it will be a little bit different to what it will be at the higher at the higher height in the same way as if you're lifting a particular weight. Um, you know, the energy that you need to expend, the amount of drive you need to get the bar over your head at, you know, 85 will be a little bit different to what it is at 90. And, you know, you do have to have opportunities to have a go at it. Mm. So, um, you know, what people often do in high jump is they stick the bar up to, you know, a really high height and then they just grind in errors. And I don't think that's useful. Yeah. Um, but, you know, how you get around that will be as varied as your um, as your athlete is. Sometimes it's more opportunity to compete. Um, you know, sometimes it's just edging the bar up. Sometimes it's not telling the athlete what height the bar is at all. Yeah. And in when you're coaching, would you be a fan then of having the bar at, at nearly their max height, you know, close to their PB? You know, some people don't. Some people will train technique and rhythm and the fluidity, you know, but others then, like, as you say, will will have a better PB in training than they have in competition. It depends, I suppose, again, on the athlete. But... Well, I suppose I tend to go back and think about what is that the athlete, is it that the athlete needs to do in order to clear that height? How can we get that process going at a lower height and then gradually edge folks up so that they are doing exactly the same thing um, pretty much at, at a higher height? That being said, you know, most high jump competitions are held outdoors. As the bar goes up, you probably need to pull your runner back a little bit. Um, just because your place of takeoff may need to be slightly different to clear a much higher height. You will also have wind conditions. It may be raining. You know, you do need to learn to high jump in a variety of different weather conditions. You can't just say, oh, it's not a nice day today, so we're not going to jump. There does have to be some jumping in less than optimum conditions. It's but, like the national championships this summer. They were wild. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they were wild. Yeah. yeah. You have to be able to do it. So, yeah. you know, there's no one answer, Olivia, and it's yeah. kind of what works for your athlete. But, mm. you know, I tend to go on the idea of what is it that, you know, you need to do. And, um, you know, what are the what are the particular points, technical points you your athlete needs to do in order to get that correct? Mm. Uh, and how can they maintain that as the bar goes up? Yeah, and you've really you've really touched on fabulous points that every single athlete can do in terms of sleep, nutrition, routine, stress management. Everyone and recovery. Regardless, recovery. And recovery. recovery. And every single athlete can do that regardless of their talent or ability. And they will improve if they do just that. If they do just that. What another thing too, because I see a lot, I always ask people how long I'm I sleep loads, but I'll always say the, and I've noticed that 
a lot well, they go to bed a lot later than me but what would you, what's your recommendation for sleep because I've, I've heard if an hour before 12 is worth two after 12 and I think there's been studies done if you can get an hour extra sleep a night it can improve your performance by is it 20 or 30 percent have you um, well, it's probably a little bit more complicated than that, like most mm. things are. Um, the sort of average um, amount of sleep that people get varies with age. And um, teenagers probably require more sleep than they think they do. Certainly the, the young sort of teenage, um, it can be sort of, you know, nine, 10 hours. So the middle teenage, it's probably more your, your eight and a half. Uh, the older teenagers sort of eight, then it goes down, you know, maybe seven and a half. And then my age group, if you can get six, you're, you know, and six good quality hours, mm -hmm. yeah, that's probably fine. And a lot of the, the more modern research is kind of saying it's more about the quality of sleep you get than the quantity. Though there are, and uh, you know, you can, I get a lot of people where they say, Lucy, I sleep for eight or nine hours, but I never wake up feeling rested. So then I need to look at why that is and what's going on. Mm. So it's not all about the length of time that you sleep. Um, routine is really, I mean, I, look, I could do a whole seminar on sleep. Lucy, and, I, I could get you doing a whole seminar on everything we've discussed there. I'm going, going breaking it down and like, OK, we'll just do a whole year of Lucy. A whole year of interviewing because just even touching there even on sleep is like say the mobile phones you know social media because like to let it get it get rid of them before especially before going to bed like leave it in the kitchen have it nowhere near you because they'll often say they'll go on it at night and then they're awake or they'll go on it first thing in the morning and then their mood drops you know i i would agree with that i i think um it's it's a lot of the devices emit blue light, light, light at the end, blue end of the spectrum. And you actually need some of that in the morning because we are biologically over many millennium. We are programmed um, to wake up and reset our, our body clock by getting blue light in the morning, which is the kind of light that is there in the morning. So you need to get outside and have your cup of coffee outside, walk to the the bus and um, cycle to school, get get some of that blue light in in the early part of the morning to reset your 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 biological clock. And then the converse is true in the couple of hours, particularly coming up to going to bed. You need to have exposure to more the red end of the, the spectrum of light. So it's kind of things like dimming the lights and um, getting off your screens, getting away from your computer, not watching television, actually talking to somebody else and um, maybe doing some relaxation or some yoga and um, listening to a podcast, reading a real book rather than a, an online book. You know, those having a routine in the same way as you have a routine for small children, you know, around their bedtime. Adults and teenagers need a routine as well. And um that does not include a, a lot of, I'm afraid, a lot of social media time. But yeah. there is a time of the day for social media and it can be part of your 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 wind down or your transition. But your your last hour or two should try to be free from blue light because that's the signal is just like wake up, wake up. Mm -hmm. uh, and you want it to be, you know, calming and sleep. And it's to do with the production and release of a substance called melatonin which is our natural, one of our natural sort of sleep drugs. The other one is or sleep um, hormones. The other one is called adenosine. And we have kind of somewhat less control over, over that. Okay. But um, melatonin, if we get exposure to blue light uh, through, through the eyes down to the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain, that sets the production of melatonin off. And then what we want, the red light is the signal to release the melatonin. To the body, to the brain to kind of release it. So again, if we interfere with that, we we interfere with that part of them um, promoting sleepiness. Yeah, Lucy, I don't want to take all your time. I've, I've seen it because I know you have to be away somewhere else. Um, I I think we could do it. We could do a call every week, Lucy. To be honest, to go through <laughs> everything, and it's 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 such a like. But if you if you were in Nina now on Saturday, we'd spend the whole four hours just listening to you talk. To be honest, because there's 
there's so much to go through. And I think like you started off there talking about motivation, the motivation of the athlete and the motivation of the coach. And, and that is key. That really is key. And then managing the lifestyle challenges, especially in the transition, those transition years and bringing it back to nutrition is key in those years. Sleep, routine, recovery. I think if you, if you can tick those boxes, the rest you can build on top of that. It's like it, you have to get the foundations right, you know. Because you, you, you meet so many athletes too, and they do a lot of training. They, you know, they think they're ticking those boxes, but then it's it's actually getting getting your support structures in place, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And really. So, Lucy, I, I won't take up much more of your time. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I think I've covered most of the points I, I jotted yeah. down anyway that I was going to go through. Oh, the only thing I have, I, I wrote, had a few questions written down as well. So what would you like to see? What improvements would you like to see now in Ireland happen? I'm mean, just, we just stick with high jump. What would you like to see? What would your vision be? Because that's well, the I questions think... we're going to ask people on Saturday too. It's, yeah. it's for the community to drive it forward as opposed to a top down approach. You know? I think the idea of, of meetups is, is really good. Um, you know, back in the day, again, when Oliver was there, we did have national squad sessions and um, those were helpful. And those kind of went by the by um, because people maybe were more into silos than into, you know, a lot of group things. I think sometimes coaches can be scared that their athletes are going to get poached or they're going to learn things that don't fit with their way of looking at it. And, um, you know, again, everyone's different and what worked for one athlete may not work for another. And we, I think we all have to be open as coaches. And I've always tried to collaborate with, you know, people like Ron Murray or Dennis Doyle in the UK um, people in the North um, you know, to go to conference to try and learn and educate myself. I don't have all the answers. I'm not, you know, Deirdre Ryan would be more of an expert than than me. Um, but I think as well, it's to remember that it is the tiny, tiny percentage that make it through to elite senior. And we can definitely have that ambition. But, you know, if we only did that, we'd have very few people high jumping. And, and there's a hope. there's a joy to high jumping. Yes, there that, is. And that's what I tell, especially teenage athletes, because I know I can't. I, I would never at my age wouldn't be able to jump like I could as a, when I was young. And there's it's, if you're flying through the air, your body is elastic. It's to me, I, I equated to surfing or something like hitting the perfect wave. It's there's the joy to jumping. So that, that that's why I tell teenagers, especially don't give up. Just enjoy it because you can't do it when you're older. You That's can right. play the guitar when you're older, you can paint, you can do all the other activities till the day you die, but you can't do sport to that elite, that level. That you, The best of your best. The best of your best could be elite, but the best of your best is the best of your best. So that's, and the joy of jump. That's the, for me, that's the motivation for me with, with this high jump is just to have fun. And it's, it's a lovely release as well. And the rhythm of jumping, yeah, so... Yeah. So, Lucy, so hopefully we can we can bring more joy into the world through jumping. <laughs> yeah, I think that would be a really nice way to, to look at it. Yeah. We get a wide enough base. If we get more people interested in high jumping, well, yeah. then you're more likely to be able to produce another one or two. Um, yeah. And then we can all cheer them on. We yeah, can all exactly. cheer them on because it, it's, it's so much fun. When you see when you see someone clearing the bar and you're and you're on their they're they're jumping for your country it's it's just fabulous it, it is mood, isn't I it? agree yeah it's really fabulous Lucy I let you go there and we'll see you at the next one as I said hopefully we'll have one in November yeah and, great and I'll, I'll report back to you too how we get on on Saturday no, no please do I'd be really I interested will yeah uh, okay yeah thanks a million Lucy pleasure all see the you. best see you soon bye 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 bye